you cite him on it? SJC 11619, Commonwealth v. Angel Santiago. May it please the court, Catherine McMahon, Assistant District Attorney for the Hamden District for the Commonwealth. First, I would like to alert the court to two recent decisions of this court that bear both on the question of probable cause and on the question of target standing. Um, the probable cause case is Commonwealth versus Stewart, written by Justice Grant Gantz. It was 469 Mass 257, and it was decided on the 7th of August. I sent a 16L letter for that case. The second is Commonwealth versus Batcher, 469 Mass 425, authored by Justice Length, decided on August 19th and cited in one of the amicus briefs. That deals with the issue of target standing. This is a case in which the defendant was charged with distribution of cocaine, and he moved to suppress evidence seized from the alleged buyer, Edwin Ramos. Um, on the issues of automatic standing and target standing. The motion judge found that automatic standing didn't apply because the defendant had already distributed the substance. He did find that the police did not have probable cause to arrest either Ramos or the defendant, that their conduct was egregious without elucidating why it was egregious, and he therefore applied target standing and allowed the motion to suppress. This case falls within the Santa Lise Kennedy apparent exchange cases. It is different from Kennedy. It is different from Santa Lise. It is different from Stewart, but the Commonwealth submits that it was sufficient for probable cause. If I, could, if I could stop you there, because we don't get there unless there's target standing, correct? We don't even address the issue of probable cause unless there's target standing, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And here, the defendant wasn't the only target. The judge found that he was the primary target, but he was the first person that the police officer was looking at because the police officer had seen the defendant driving for several hours back and forth on a bicycle in a high crime neighborhood when the police officer was in a stationary assignment so he couldn't follow him two days before. The type of behavior in his experience, and he had 16 years experience as a police officer, two in the narcotics unit, 10 years in that neighborhood, which was known for high crime, gang activity, but drug doesn't, activity. Doesn't that make him the target? Doesn't all those facts that you that just is, said? He is one of the targets when he follows him and sees the apparent exchange. And the judge did not find an exchange, but based on Stewart, the conduct that was observed, the defendant reaching towards Ramos and Ramos putting something in his pocket subsequently allows a reasonable inference that there was an exchange. And based on that, Ramos was searched, and he and the defendant were both arrested. The judge found that they were both targets, but the defendant was the primary target. In Batcher, the question was whether um, the interrogation of two juveniles in violation of Commonwealth versus a juvenile's um, interested adult standard, where the defendant was one of the targets, whether the target standing applied. The court didn't reach the question of whether it was egregious misconduct concerning the two juveniles because they were targets along with the defendant. So here, he's not the sole target, he's not the sole reason, and they're both small fish. Okay. Well, yeah, let, me, let me, I guess, imagine a different hypothetical, okay? It's more similar to what the amicus references. But let's assume that you, they were, there, were, there was a focus on a major drug kingpin, and they learned that the person was a courier. Uh, they had no particular interest in the courier, although he was part of the conspiracy. But they wanted to search the home of the courier. They had no probable cause to do so, but they thought that maybe they could find something that would implicate the kingpin with regard to it. Uh, would you agree there that there would be targets standing to challenge that search? <clears throat> Did they get a search warrant without no, probable cause? No, they just so, basically so there was the no home, like screening by a magistrate. Counting on the absence of standing with regard to the kingpin, with no particular intent. If to they intentionally if they intentionally violated the courier's rights in order to get information against the kingpin, then that would be a case in which target standing might apply as the big fish, little fish. But the second question is,
the fundamental, is it fundamental unfairness or was there egregious police misconduct? If they were close on probable cause, but not, not all the way there, is that egregious police misconduct? And, and that's the question here. The Commonwealth submits that there was probable cause once the exchange was observed, or the apparent exchange was observed. But even if there wasn't, there was at least a reasonable suspicion. That doesn't allow a search of Ramos because a reasonable suspicion doesn't allow a search. You need probable cause for that. But does it make that mistake egregious misconduct? Because is every police mistake egregious misconduct? And that's the, the case law talks about distinctly egregious, serious misconduct. And um, in other jurisdictions, it's like targeting a person because you know he's on probation. And if you arrest him, that will violate his probation. Here, um, one case of egregious misconduct was the old case of Commonwealth versus Lewin, when either the informant was created falsely or the information from the informant was created falsely for the purpose of a search warrant. But when it's close but no cigar, is that egregious police misconduct? So, 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 so help me understand. So. Do I understand you to say that egregious misconduct in this context means basically no good faith basis to search? It could be no good faith basis to search. It could be that um, the, the means of the search was like physically violent or extremely intrusive without like a, a search warrant like for a body cavity search. Um, but... In, in Massachusetts, they either haven't found that it was extremely egregious misconduct or they haven't found that target standing applied because the defendant was the target or the evidence taken from the other person wasn't used tangibly against the subject defendant. So target standing has, has not been accepted by the U.S. Supreme Court as a federal matter, correct? No, and it has been discussed in a line of cases here. I think it's Manning, Price, Garnamaglia, and recently Vatcher, um, and it has not been adopted here. Right. So are, is, it, is your suggestion that we should start to go down that road or and that we could, should go down it only so far, or, or is it your view that we really shouldn't open that? My view is that we, we shouldn't open it. Um, and the, this court previously has articulated reasons why not to accept target standing. One, privacy rights are personal and not to be vicariously asserted. So two, the person whose rights have been violated, we should limit the exclusionary rule to that person. Here, Ramos was arrested. Although, he, although this, uh, you know, he, there's a certain inconsistency in that because the purpose of the exclusionary rule is to deter police misconduct. It isn't really to protect the privacy of whomever. And so... It seems to me that one can, one could take the view that target standing actually advances the purpose of the exclusionary rule. This court has previously weighed the deterrence and has determined that you're excluding probative evidence against this third party, the person whose rights weren't violated. Traditionally, we allow um, suppression motions for the person whose personal rights has been violated, that there be administrative difficulties in looking into the motives of police versus the, the third that, parties. That, that just goes and the to fact what? that they decided that the deterrence factor is sufficiently met by allowing the person whose <laughs> right was violated to litigate a motion to suppress and wouldn't be further exp um, wouldn't be a further benefit or a significant <clears throat> benefit to allow third parties to also move to suppress something that was seized from a third person. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, um, the judge here made, um, had a hearing, right, on a motion to suppress yes. an evidentiary hearing? Yes. And he said that, or he or she said that he thought that the violation of Ramos' rights was intentional as well as egregious. Do you think that we are in any way required to defer? It, it, he found that um, there, was in, there wasn't probable cause. And he found that there was no exchange. 
but based on Stewart and based on the conduct that he saw and he credited the police officer saw, there was an apparent exchange. There is a reasonable inference for an exchange. So, so in your review of the constitutional principles, which is de novo, you can determine that the facts that were found by the judge, even though the motion judge rejected them as being an exchange, are under Stewart a reasonable inference of an exchange. So he's a deter- Well, if, if, if they have probable cause, they didn't intentionally violate Ramos's rights. And based on the conduct that the judge credited, the defendant reaching out and the other person then putting his hand immediately into his shirt pocket, that under Stewart is a reasonable inference of an exchange, which means that the motion judge was incorrect on the question of probable cause. And therefore, there was no intentional, deliberate violation of Ramos's rights if the police had probable cause. Well, I think the question Justice Link had was, if there was a finding by the motion judge that it was intentional, would an intentional violation be a uh, no good faith basis under your egregious standard and, and if it was and must we defer to that finding i don't think it can defer to the finding when it's based on his reluctance to say that there was an apparent exchange when under your your description of what a reasonable inference of exchange in and stewart is some kind of conduct that demonstrates that one person reached out to another another person took something um, his attempt to parse that away isn't supported by the facts that he found. Is, is it your, maybe what you're saying is, if the facts indicate probable cause, regardless of the judge didn't find probable cause, if probable cause existed, then the motivation of the officer becomes irrelevant? Is that what you're saying? Well, then how can you say that he deliberately or unintentionally violated Ramos's rights okay. if he was acting with probable cause? Then he didn't. He may have done something intentionally, but it wasn't violating his <clears throat> right. rights. And if, and if he acted and it wasn't enough for probable cause, unlike Santelise, you don't see money in exchange for an object you don't see what was exchanged. And you see something going one way, but something not going the other way. Although the police officer said that sometimes the money and the drugs are exchanged in different places and at different times. Unlike Kennedy, you don't have a per one of the players being somebody who's known for drug distribution. But in this case, you've got two days before the repeated activity over a period of hours in a hot zone of the city known for drug and gang activity that the police officer in his experience said was like drug runners, the people who make the deliveries or the exchanges of the drugs and the money between the sellers and the buyers. They then two days later followed the defendant again on the bicycle for about a half mile area of this hot zone where he goes north on Main Street. They lose sight of him on Cumberland. He goes south, he goes to Bancroft Street, which is the area of Maine and Bancroft is where this police officer himself has made about 50 arrests for narcotics offenses. So like Kennedy, you've got a specific site that's known for drug activity. It's not as good as Stewart, where you've got the street with the doorways, where the police know that the people go into those specific doorways to make drug deals, and the crowd, it's like at least four people go into a doorway. But better than Stewart, there's actually a seeing of conduct that allows a reasonable inference of an exchange. So on that basis, high crime area, experienced police officer, conduct allowing a reasonable inference of an exchange, the drug runner driving back and forth on the bike activity for a period of several hours, uh, two days before the previous time that this police officer saw the defendant, establishes probable cause. Therefore, the intent wasn't a bad intent by the police officer, it was justified. And even if he only had a reasonable suspicion, is that egregious misconduct 
where since Ramos had the ability, although he decided not to litigate a motion to suppress, that you're going to allow, allow a third party to exercise Ramos's or to raise Ramos's rights. And that's the position of the Commonwealth. All right, thank you. Thank you. Morning, members of the court. May it please the court, I'm Frederick Bartman, and um, I represent Angel Santiago, and um, and honored to be um, part of this argument this morning. Um, I'm going to ask the justices to um, uphold the um, findings and rulings of um, uh, Judge Ferrara uh, in allowing the motion to suppress. Where, where is the where is the epidemic of these illegal searches looking <clears throat> for big fish? Right. I mean, so to answer that question, I have to go outside the record. Um, I, and, and I guess if I can, I would like to answer it this way. I think that's the whole point as we look um, contempor con contemp in a contemporary manner at the need for target standing. Um, this, this issue um, is that um, <coughs> Mr. Santiago and Mr. Ramos in particular and anyone else uh, in the city of Springfield um, has the constitutional right of privacy. I understand that, but are, are we training police officers to not to worry about the Constitution, shake down the small fish to get the big fish? I don't see that in a training manual anymore. Right. Or um, I, I don't know the answer to that beyond the scope of the case that I'm, I'm here before your honors on. The case in which an apparent drug transaction was seen and intercepted. That's a well, but sure. And but in this particular case, it's important, I think, to start by distinguishing what this officer observed um, from the other cases that have been cited by the Commonwealth in terms of the number of different specific uh, observations that were made, not just this is a high crime area, not just there's gang and drug activity, uh, not just I'm well trained, and not just that when somebody cycles back and forth over a location with no other indication of any wrongdoing, that somehow this is all indicative of drug dealing. Now, from the eyes of the trained officer, his attention is drawn. And when he sees this gentleman again a couple of days later, he, he recollects this person. But in comparison to these other cases in which probable cause is found, um, if we're going to take the, sil the silent movie um, description um, when you try and connect the dots in a case like Kennedy, um, this wasn't a silent movie. This was barely the opening credits. And I think the reason you need target standing for um, Mr. Santiago or anybody else, whether or not it's policy and training across the police, de uh, a police department, um, is because we, we have to not analyze these cases by um, broadening the evidence of probable cause where it doesn't actually exist, simply because this officer has all this training. Um, and um, and uh, is going to look through that lens. What should be the basis of, of our um, uh, determination that target standing should be a principle? Should it be the Declaration of Rights? Should it be common law? Should it be our supervisory powers? Sure. Well, certainly I look under um, the Manning decision uh, and cases that follow, as well as the, the other cases cited in the amicus briefs, um, from Alaska, California, um, that, um, that it's rooted in the state constitution, and in this case, Article 14. Um, there's certainly nothing in Article 14 um, that requires that the right be personal, and um, we certainly have recognized that with regard to automatic standing. Um, and what we are looking at as is the deterrence issue, um, as you pointed out during the Commonwealth's presentation. Um, we have a situation where... Should, should we apply the principle of target standing whenever um, there is a violation of a third party's um, fourth, or Article 14 rights uh, f when evidence mm -hmm. is going to be used in a defendant's case? Um, I think uh, as the Manning case came close to the you know, enunciating as, as the actual rule, 
Um, in instances where the conduct is intentional, yes. And I would add also... Intentional in what sense? In, in the sense of, let's say, that they're aware that they're in the infancy of an investigation, they don't have probable cause, the primary target is the person that sold the drugs, uh, allegedly, not the person that bought the drugs. And so they're going to go into the shirt pocket of the person that bought the drugs, knowing that they don't have probable cause for that search. Has any other state in the country uh, adopted uh, target standing? Um, Alaska has, and Louisiana has, and I think California uh, at one time had, um, and I can't remember specifically, I think they may have um, amended their constitution in a manner that took that um, option away. But yes, this, this issue has been embraced in situations similar embraced to the- Embraced in two states? Yes, Your Honor. That's what I'm aware of. Um, and, 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 and if we were to embrace it, when would it apply? Would it mean that, would it mean that everybody can challenge the search of anybody else where the evidence from that person was used against the defendant? I think in, in, in situations in which the conduct of the police was either intentional. Intentional referring to the, the subjective intent of the officer? Um, well, as supported by the, the underlying facts of the circumstance, I mean, you do have to make that finding, in addition to it being intentional, that indeed it was unconstitutional. Um, you know, as, as Your Honor pointed out, um, had there been probable cause, then the fact that the officer's intent was to violate Ramos's rights would be irrelevant. Fucking specific intent here. I, I <laughs> intend to violate this person's constitutional rights in order to acquire evidence against someone I'm really investigating. I, I, or to, I think I have a basis on which to search this individual. I don't know if it'll stand up in court or not, but I think it's close enough. I don't know that this court should embrace a good faith basis exception to this. I, I think, and again, looking at the facts for Mr. Santiago, this was either intentional or with reckless indifference. And all, all you have to do is look at the officer's testimony to see that um, this was uh, an officer that when he testified first to what he saw, he actually told the judge, I saw um, Santiago hand a small item to um, Ramos. And then one question further on it, he, was, he went on to say, well, I didn't actually see it, but when I searched Ramos's pocket, I found it, so therefore I saw it. That well, he, saw an ex he saw something happen, hand went out, person took hand, put something in pocket. I didn't see the object. Well, that's pretty good cross-examination. He may not have seen the object, but he certainly saw enough to conclude an exchange had taken place. He, certainly, it, it, as, as, as he ultimately said and as other, other cases have um, analyzed, there was an appearance of some kind of a transaction. Um, and, and the judge, in fact, found and credited the testimony ultimately that that's what this officer observed. But um, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the reason that we need target standing is in cases like this, um, this officer, um, over now two out of the previous three days had an interest in Mr. Santiago and his reason for with either reckless indifference or intent um, to, to disregard um, whether or not this was going to be a valid search with regard to Mr. Ram Ramos was to be able to arrest Mr. Santiago for what he had been suspecting for now over a three-day period. Yeah, but are you suggesting, when you said the judge credited there was an appearance of some kind of transaction, and you're saying, well, yes, but it doesn't mean it's a drug transaction? Well, it doesn't mean it's anything yet. As I said in the analogy to the silent movie, granted this officer has training, granted that this is... Yeah, but just what he saw. He saw the hand go out. If Justice Cordy is right, that's what he saw. On this particular day, he saw Mr. Santiago um, cycling for a matter of minutes. He wasn't going to and from a stash house. He was nothing, none, none of those indicia. He saw Mr. Santiago riding a bicycle, dismounting, two people coming up, and hands coming in contact, and Mr. 
Um, he, he saw an arm extended, right? An, an arm extended, and then... Hands um, coming in contact, and then Ramos putting something in his pocket? Appeared to. He certainly put his hand in his pocket area. Again, um, crediting the officer and understanding training and high crime area and, and his suppositions, um, it appeared to him that he had observed the drug transaction. But in terms of where we go uh, with, this, with this set of facts, um, in, in all circumstances uh, in the Commonwealth, there needs to be more uh, for an establishment of anything even remotely close to a probable cause search of Mr. Ramos's pocket. Um, what, what, what would be more, what, what do you say would be enough to make probable cause? Well, um, I could cite to any of the cases the Commonwealth did, but, but just... What, what should have happened, what would, what would need to have happened here for there to be probable cause? In this particular instance? Yes. Well, I don't think there could have been anything more in, uh, other than had this <clears throat> officer also observed not only cycling, um, but that, that, that um, Mr. Santiago had actually been um, greeting potential customers, heading back to a stash house, that he had something in, in coming to and from his hands or his pockets, anything other than this moment in time where the officer sees a cyclist, sees two people greet each other, sees one put his hands into his pocket, and then that's it. That's probable cause. I'm going to go see what Ramos has in his pocket. That's simply not enough. Um, and the other thing about target standing and why I think it's so important in cases like this or other um, cases, and they don't have to be kingpins to be a big fish. Um, this is all relative in... in in, in communities around the Commonwealth, and there is no deterrent effect, I would posit, if you keep the power in the Commonwealth to decide what to do with the case of the person whose rights have been violated. I mean, how, Im how meaningful is, is the, 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 this analogy to fish? I mean, is, is, do you need a tuna? Do you need a cod? Could you have a sardine and an anchovy? I mean, what, what, what's behind it? I, I think what's behind it is more um, uh, getting at the issue of who are they really targeting, rather than um, trying to quantify them by the size of the fish. Um, and so um, in, in this instance and in most instances I think they're getting at here, um, they are targeting uh, the, um, the seller. And like the Vasher case as a, as a point of comparison, which this court just decided, um, it was clear that the officer um, was um, equally interested in the other two youths whose rights he purportedly violated uh, in order to obtain probable cause to search the house of the person who was ultimately charged with murder. Okay, so, so, so here, if, if, even if there is some evidence that could, have, could be used in a traditional sense to support a finding of probable cause to believe that there was a drug transaction, but it falls short. Um, and even if it's a low-level drug dealer and a, and a user, um, target standing should, should apply in that case. I believe so, yes, Your Honor. And, 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 um, so, so essentially, the, the, the exclusionary rule... Uh, uh, the, the exclusionary rule, of, uh, uh, you don't need egregious misconduct by the police. You just need something that falls short of, of probable cause. I, I think when you're trying to apply a constitutional right to a third party, um, you probably need more than just that um, in terms of the conduct being intentional or at least recklessly indifferent. I'm not here s stating a standard for all purposes to give third parties standing. But in circumstances like this one, the only way to deter future police conduct um, is to give uh, Mr. Santiago the opportunity um, to, to challenge the search that was done primarily for the purpose of prosecuting him. And the idea of that somehow this conduct can be deterred if you litigate the motion with regard to the, per, the smaller fish or they dismiss the charges against the smaller fish, I would argue that actually furthers the potential for a future misconduct because it puts all of the, um, uh, um, all of the control on the issue in the hands of the Commonwealth. Now, in this case, uh, if, if we agree with you, 
could the Commonwealth called call Ramos to testify? That that's um, it had had they not violated his rights. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Did you say if you did find probable cause? No. If we agree with you that the, that the order of suppression should stand, could the Commonwealth nevertheless try uh, Mr. Santiago and call Ramos to testify against him? Um, and they would have to try and prove the case with the with the drugs themselves having been suppressed. That's right. Um, I believe they could. And in fact, prior to this issue, in terms of of the motion to suppress, it had been my wonder whether or not. Uh, that was he was going to be their primary witness, um, but um, but that that is that situation did not evolve. All right, thank you, thank you, your honors. <clears throat>